Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Midshipman First Class Emily Bobrick, and I'm very honored to be introducing our featured speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Peter Warren Singer. Dr. Singer is strategist and senior fellow at New America. He has been named by the Smithsonian as one of the nation's 100 leading innovators by Defense News as one of the 100 most influential people in defense issues by foreign policy as their top 100 global thinkers list and as a, an official mad scientist for the U.S. Army's Training and Doctrine Command. Dr. Singer was coordinator of the Obama campaign's Defense Policy Task Force, named to the U.S. Military's Transformation Advisory Group, NATO's Innovation Advisory Board for Unmanned Maritime Systems, and the NSA's Advisory Board. He has served as a consultant for the U.S. Military Intelligence Community and FBI. Dr. Singer is also the author of multiple best-selling award-winning books. His book, Like War, explored how social media has changed the politics and war and has been named an Amazon and Foreign Affairs Book of the Year. He is also the co-author of Ghost Fleet, a novel of the next world war, which joined the professional reading list of every branch of the U.S. military, leading to briefings everywhere from the White House to the Pentagon. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Singer. So thank you so much for that um, incredibly kind uh, welcome. One of the things that it uh, didn't mention, and there was no reason that you would know this, is a reason why uh, this is a special honor for me to join. And I very much appreciate the invitation because um, my mother was actually born at the Naval Academy when my grandfather served here. I'm not gonna reveal the date, that would get me in trouble, but she was literally born um, a couple hundred yards away. Uh, so I am a, a Naval Academy, I guess, a baby of a baby in a totally different way. So just a huge honor to be able to speak here up on stage to you. Um, so the event that we've been gathered to um, talk about is around the challenge of critical thinking. But there's actually two parts of this challenge, and much of our focus has been on the first. And I would argue, um, not just in events, but in our overall professional training on the second part of the challenge. So the first part of the challenge of critical thinking is um, how do we identify engage with the new, whether it's, um, as you've heard about, new technologies, new threats, new potentials, new questions. How do we wrestle with the new? That's tough enough. But there's a second part of this challenge, which is how do we communicate these new and therefore quite disruptive and challenging ideas to our key target audiences. That is, we have a challenge of not just understanding, but explaining and gaining and retaining the attention of those that we wanna reach, all the more when so much else is competing for their attention, both so much else is competing in media space, so much else is competing in their mind space. And this is the case whether we're talking about trying to reach a, a four-star admiral or whether you're trying to reach um, someone serving, uh, a, a youth serving in your unit, or you're trying to reach Congress, or you're trying to reach the public. So it's the second part of the challenge that I'm gonna speak to you today about, which I think is just so essential to actually achieving change. Now, there's many ways to go after this challenge, but the one that they've asked me to speak to you about is a new approach that's um, called useful fiction, or sometimes it's been called FICINT, short for fictional intelligence. As you can see here, it's been used by organizations that range from the Navy to NATO to Fortune 500 companies. It's been featured in media, whether it's um, old guard media like The Economist or new guard media like Wired Magazine. What is it? It is basically the fusion, the deliberate fusion of nonfiction research and analysis with narrative. So it's bringing together real world data, real world research, real world policy papers, 
but sharing them not through the traditional white paper or memorandum, but rather by wrapping it within a story. A different way of thinking about it is um, it's what I do to my kids in the morning. I sneak fruit and veggies into a smoothie. Just in this case, the kale is the policy paper, the PowerPoint brief, the technology diagram, the doctrine, the strategy. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got um, milkshakes. And I love my milkshakes, and I love my literary versions of them, science fiction, techno thrillers. But they are designed for entertainment purposes, right? And even they, aren't, they don't hold themselves to um, uh, facts, or they don't have the footnotes. So um, the bad guys uh, hacked uh, the US fleet. How'd they do it? Clickety-clack, they hacked the US fleet, as opposed to here's a footnote on how they did it, right? So the point of this is, is useful fiction is a deliberate fusion of those where you are taking the kale of the policy world and wrapping it within narrative. Now, there's a lot of different um, approaches to creating it. Uh, as was referenced, one that we did, um, which is probably why I got invited here, is Ghost Fleet, which was a novel, but a novel with 27 pages of research and notes. A different example um, might be a um, short story. Uh, this was a project uh, that was originally for the leadership of Special Operations Command. They uh, are wrestling with their strategy and what does winning look like vis-a-vis -vis China and Taiwan? Well, what does winning look like? It doesn't just look like us beating them in a war. True winning looks like them choosing never to go to war. And one of the lessons of deterrence is that it's not merely about what you do, but it's rather what the adversary is thinking. So we took that and we created a narrative that was written from the perspective of a PLA general looking back on why they never invaded Taiwan, but mixed in are the 20 real world things that we could do over the next couple of years that would make them look at an invasion of Taiwan as something that is not appetizing. Now, what was interesting is that project was not just used for briefings for um, senior leaders, it was actually, as you see here, a testimony uh, to US Congress. And for those of you that um, ever have the pleasure to testify to Congress, there's your verbal statement, but there's also your written statement. And the staffers came up to me afterwards and said, um, yours, this narrative, was actually the only one that the members actually read. Um, <laughs> There's also the idea of an anthology. Uh, so this is an example of a project um, for the British government where they have a lengthy report about lo a lot of the key technologies that you've heard about today, including just um, from General Mattis. Uh, what do they mean for the future of Britain? Uh, lengthy report, target audience, flag officers, defense minister, written by scientists and analysts. Doesn't really land with the effect that they want. And so what we did is we took their report, each of those technologies, and created a narrative around them that doesn't say this is what will happen, but rather it serves as a way for understanding. Here's how AI works. Here's what quantum means for the future, et cetera. And very relevant to um, this building, the unifying narrative was they were stories set in the 2030s that were riffs off of real world historic events in the 20th century. So as an example, on the um, bottom uh, right there, the nonfiction content was about um, uh, how emergent energy changes are going to reshape geopolitics and the areas of the world that we might care about. There might be areas that used to not be strategically significant, but would with these new energy issues. Um, and that was their analysis. And so we turned that into a um, story. As you can see here, it's an obituary of a young officer who had made their career working in the insurgencies that took place in these um, places, that, these locales in the world that used to not be strategically significant, but now were the new battlegrounds. They wrote a memoir about their lessons learned. It became popular. They grew uncomfortable with their celebrity, and they've died in an electric motorcycle accident. Uh, for those of you that know military history, but also great cinema, it's the story of Lawrence Arabia 
move forward, but used as a way for us to understand emergent energy shifts, just like uh, oil did in the past. It might be a fake document. Um, on the left is one for NATO that came out of a report trying to uh, explain quantum technology. You might be surprised, but um, deputy defense ministers and three-star admirals are not psyched to receive 30-page reports on quantum tech that have a glossary in the back. Um, and so we worked with them to create, instead, it's a fake intelligence report from the future that carries across what they need to know. It's in a format that they're familiar with, but also gives a little bit of more emotional punch. Why should we pay attention to it? On the right is um, a different one for uh, the Pentagon's AI office that's helping to explain the Pentagon's new AI strategy, but through the ultimate nightmare scenario for a mid-level manager. It's one thing to say we might lose a war against China. It's another to say the GAO might do a report on your office. And as you can see here, it's not just a fake GAO report from the future, that when you read it, you get the real world strategy elements, but there's actually art added to it where it's as if the undersecretary read it over the weekend, there's a coffee stain, they've highlighted key points. Of course, what they've highlighted are the real world points that people want to know. Um, it might be a uh, fake news article. This is from a um, space economy project. Uh, it visualizes the future of the space economy, but does it in a way of a kind of a, a Sunday morning uh, magazine profile of someone. And of course, it's an astronaut who doesn't exist. But through reading that profile, you learn what the space economy might actually be like. Um, as you can see here, there's also artwork sometimes. Um, what I love about this one is it takes real world issues that Russia is dealing with right now and microchip um, uh, uh, running out of them, moves them into a US context. Supply chain is one of the real world issues that we explored in Ghost Fleet and is of course of major concern to the US military and frames it in a way that sort of resonates and is familiar to us. And um, finally, you might have a combination of text and artwork, graphic novella. This is a, a cybersecurity project. Okay, um, let's get back to being classic wonks. Why is it that narrative, and I need to be very clear here, narrative does not mean made up. Narrative can be nonfiction. There was that one time uh, you heard from General Mattis, there was this time in Iraq, or there was this time in my earlier career. Narrative is a story, right? It doesn't have to be fiction. But basically, why is it that narrative is so powerful? Well, there's several reasons. The first is um, science, whether it's uh, studies from neuroscience to international relations, transcripts of senior leaders, um, have found that it is a more effective means of conveying new and or complex information. Um, essentially, if we hook you up to a brain monitor and you read a um, piece of doctrine, uh, you read a, um, uh, a scientific journal article, one part of your brain lights up. If you read a story, four parts of your brain light up. Why is this? It's basically because of evolution. Story is the oldest communication technology of all. We were using story to convey new or complex ideas um, you know, when we were in caves. PowerPoint, as you can see there, was created in 1987. Why would we think that that is the best way to convey information? And yet, um, for those of you uh, who are further in your career, Think about how much expertise you've built in creating PowerPoint versus in narrative. Um, a second value of story. Story brings in emotion. And while we don't like to admit it, uh, whether it is in a cabinet meeting, a decision to vote, a decision among senior leaders to go to war, we repeatedly find that it is emotion that often drives the sale. It's something that everyone from a drill instructor to a used car salesman know, that it is not just understanding, it is emotion that leads to action. 
the emotion that you can use with narrative, and you can be strategic about it, can be a positive emotion. This is from a project um, that we did actually for General Brown when he was um, the head of the Air Force, now he's chairman of the Joint Chiefs. There's a Air Force meeting called Corona where they bring in um, all the four stars every six months and sort of help uh, think through the future of it. Um, and so we worked with him and his team uh, to help prepare uh, for that with this project that you see here, where it was serving as a means of conveying, um, none of this is classified, of course, you know, key issues for the future of the Air Force, competition with China, new domains, a new generation joining. And so it took those issues, but shared them through, as you see here, a vision of what if they were meeting 25 years out? And it had everything from a fake speech being given at that event 25 years out to, as you can see there, an Air Force recruiting poster 25 years out. And so it was a way of both sharing the information, but also painting a picture, which then in the real world was, well, if we like this vision of the Air Force and 25 years out is important because it's the 100 year anniversary of the creation of the Air Force. So if we want the Air Force to look like this on its 100 year birthday, this is what we've got to do to make it happen. It might be the opposite. It might be a negative emotion, a nightmare scenario, something that you don't want to have happen, and then you say, what can I do to prevent it? Uh, on the left, for example, is a project we did with the Australian military from some real world um, things re uh, revealing how uh, we're gearing up relevant to this discussion here for certain types of missile threats and that some of our best systems are not equipped for more common ones. Um, or there's what if we don't do uh, defense reforms? We might see news like that. A third value of narrative is what we call change management. If you want change in your organization, you can't just say, this is an innovative idea. I've done critical thinking. You have to bring the organization along with you. And part of that is that people have to understand the story of the need for change, but also their role in the change. How do I fit in within this overall agenda that we have? Um, it's the reason why Steve Jobs uh, once said that, quote, the most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. Fourth value. Research from everywhere from um, Harvard Business Review to the Journal of Behavioral Decision Making has found that wrapping something within a narrative increases innovation, increases creativity. Uh, it helps you do everything from project risk better to find new pathways. Actually, um, their studies found that it uh, achieves roughly a 30% increase in the levels of innovation and creativity, which I think is really interesting given um, innovation is the new buzzword around the Pentagon. It replaced lethality, that earlier replaced um, network-centric, you name it. So if we actually care about innovation, are we bringing in best practices from industry? Fifth value, it's a lower barrier to entry. The only actual scarce resource that we have right now is time. Whether it's Secretary of the Navy or the midshipmen, that's the one thing that we all consistently don't have enough of. So when you are pitching that idea, whether it's a new program we ought to invest in or um, why this strategy isn't going to work. You have to deal with that issue of a scarce resource of time. And narrative is bluntly a easier ask of the person, the target audience's time, their time and attention. Um, and it's not just that it's more enjoyable, it's also something that can um, be deployed in times and settings that other conveyance of information can't. We, for example, have found that for our own products, um, they are often read on weekends and or on plane flights, which is not something that, you know, you don't, uh, maybe there is someone in this room, but you don't wake up on a Saturday morning and, you know, get a, a nice cup of coffee and sit, you know, and go, you know what, oh, man, this would be the perfect time to read some doctrine. Oh, gosh. Um, 
or you don't, you don't, I am looking at our, you don't, and this is how the story, the story of how Ghost Fleet took off within the US Navy is that staffers for the then CNO gave the boss, rather than the traditional binder, which if for the midshipmen, if you haven't done the, when you are a staff officer, when your leader goes out on a trip or is preparing for a meeting, you create a folder with a binder of all the things that they're supposed to read and it's got tabs. See, there we go, right there. Um, instead, they said, hey, sir, we're gonna give you a draft of a novel. Um, appropriately enough, uh, he was about to take a trans-Pacific flight. And he said, wow, thank you. You know, this is uh, a lot better than my normal thing. Um, and so he was engaged to read it. Uh, he was thankful to read it. He could read it in a setting that he wouldn't normally. Um, but this hits the final value of narrative, distribution. As humans, we don't just consume story, we like to share story. He got off the plane and he later told us, reached out to a variety of flag officers in the US Navy. Um, some of them, it was, hey, could this actually happen? Other ones, it was people that he knew from the Naval Academy. Hey, here's a book you might enjoy. Hey, this links back to some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, the result is that he actually shared out the PDF with a bunch of people and we didn't get book sales from it. Um, but on the other hand, that's how it took off within the US Navy. And going back to this notion of story, we connect over story. Um, you've never come back from a vacation. You didn't, you're not gonna come back from winter break and say, there was the most amazing white paper that I read on vacation. You would love it. But we will, we connect to people that are old friends, family, to when we meet new people, we share story with them. One of the interesting things, and we don't talk to our partners about it, is we even can't help ourselves but share stories that we hate. So um, my partner, for example, laughs about, I am obsessed with telling everyone about how bad the tomorrow war is. Um, there's a nod over there. Um, but the key here is that there's someone in this room going, no, nah, it can't be that bad. And they're Googling on it right now, right? But you would never do that. Man, there was this um, article. It was so bad. Oh, that sounds, uh, it can't be that bad. I'll check it out, right? So you're, again, utilizing natural human affinity. Um, with the remainder of my time, though, is that I'd like to take you through um, a different part of the story. And this is normally something that uh, we'll work with groups over the course of a day or two days. Um, we're actually heading off to um, do for some of your peers uh, up in Canada. But it basically turns on the idea of if it is like a smoothie, there's a recipe to doing it. You can't just throw things together. And so with the remainder of my time, I'd like to share with you the elements of a successful narrative. And to be very clear here, not just the elements of a successful fiction narrative, but if you are trying to share a story about um, an experience on a warship, a lesson from the academy, you name it. The way to think about this is that some people are natural born storytellers. Um, other people have to learn how to do it. It's the same thing with jokes. Some people are natural born comedians, but you can learn the essence of how to tell a joke. I, for example, have seen Bill Gates successfully tell a joke. It's not a natural thing, but the point is you can learn it. So what are those elements of a successful narrative? Again, whether it, you are building a fiction or you're building a narrative to persuade the value of a new naval doctrine. One, um, who is your target audience? Who are you trying to reach? What is your ask of them? And how can you show that you understand their world? And what are the concerns? What are the emotional triggers that they have? Second, Different than what you are taught in most writing and briefings and a lot of speeches, do not do bottom line up front. Because all that means is someone listens in at the top and then they zone off at the end. Notice I didn't do it here. You will lose the audience if you do that. 
Instead, your goal, again, whether it is an article, a speech, or a fictional scenario, is that you want to take them on a journey. Part of your responsibility as a communicator is to get them to the end of the story. That is actually success. Third, every story has a setting, whether it's a historic event or it's something made up you have to convey to them a place that simultaneously feels real, but it exists within their imagination. And that setting has to ideally serve a purpose. Why is it set there? So think about the cliche of, it was a dark and stormy night. It's seven words, it's a cliche. On the other hand, think of how much is conveyed by starting with, it was a dark and stormy night. Each of you can kind of imagine it. It provokes a certain kind of emotion, etc. So let me give you um, an example of how setting uh, links to narrative goal. We did a project um, trying to help uh, cyber uh, board members of a company understand um, cybersecurity threats, something that we've talked about in this event as well. And one of the issues uh, right now is not awareness of cyber threats, but rather people getting tired of talking about them. They become numb to them. And so the fear of senior leaders is, um, yeah, we're going to get hacked, so what? And so what we did is um, to help communicate some issues with uh, cyber threats, we created a scenario of what would happen if that company was hacked, but what would your life be like a week later, senior leader, as they are, the setting of it is they're flying to Washington, D.C. on a commercial jet because um, CEOs no longer, when they're going to Washington, they no longer fly in their private jets. Um, and you are in coach class, and you are about to have to go testify to Congress and answer questions from the media. And you can feel in this scene the kind of um, physical discomfort, the shift, and what it's trying to convey is not, oh, you might not have enough knee space. It's the idea that for powerful people, senior admirals to um, board members, powerlessness is what they fear most. That provokes action. You will be in a position where you're not the one giving the speech. You're going to have to answer to questions for others. Right. That's why we need to engage um, in preventing this scenario from coming true. It's a very similar to like um, and very relevant to the past speakers. Uh, I, I do talks for um, senior leaders uh, on, you know, congratulations, you've become a three or a four star. Now I have to go through executive ed. I find it fascinating that these are people who are perfectly willing to run into machine gun fire. But the idea of testifying to Congress or doing a press interview scares them to the, to the soul, right? Um, so we have to connect setting to what is our ask. Fourth, every story has a character. Again, whether it's a real world story or a made up story. And the key is that characters have to be someone that we want to um, follow not just through extraordinary circumstances, but often ordinary circumstances. And they also have to be rich. They have to have details. Ideally, they in your story, they evolve. They're not the same at the end as they were at the beginning. Um, arguably, one of the best uh, characters in um, modern uh, narrative is Saul Goodman here. Who's, what's so fascinating about him is that uh, he is someone who desperately wants to be good, but the only thing that he's good at is being bad. That's a great character. Next, um, fifth, that character, every story has a protagonist, every story has an adversary, the villain. Now, the villain can be an individual, the villain can be bureaucracy, but there has to be some kind of opposition. And whether you are um, building a narrative or you are building a war game or a training session, the best villain is not someone who tugs at their mustache 
and we easily defeat them. Everything goes according to plan. That serves no narrative value. That serves no real world value. Another part of every good villain in reality and in fiction is that villains usually believe they're the hero of the story. That was the case with Thanos. That is the case with members of ISIS. And you have to understand that complexity and build it into your narrative and your plans and assumptions. They're not the hero of the story, but they think they are. Six, every story can't capture every single detail. Otherwise, it's literally living through the reality of it. So you have to have some detail, but the detail has to serve a purpose. So a great example of this is um, the character of John Wick. Um, I've done the research for you. John Wick has killed 439 people across his movies. He has killed them in ways that range from punches to pencils. He is a mass murderer by any measure. But because of a single scene where John Wick likes his dog and the dog likes John Wick, we accept him as the hero of the story. It's literally in narrative terms called a pet the dog moment. Um, and I'm not saying uh, you know, every, every, you know, every story needs a dog in it. What I'm talking about is the deployment of a single detail that serves a purpose, a larger story. So let's go back to that um, uh, example of the executive in the back of the plane thinking through what's happened to their company in the wake of a cyber attack, the powerlessness feel, and they're ruminating over all the real world things that could have been done that would have kept them from being in that position. And what they're doing though with their hand is they're holding a plastic cup. And it's one, it sort of captures, you know, the cheapness of, of where you're at, but also the plastic cup is fragile, right? And so details serve a purpose. The final thing that um, every story has is an ending. And an ending needs to bring it all together. An ending uh, needs to carry across that message. Um, and an ending has to leave you feeling both content, but maybe sometimes wanting a little bit more. And the master of this uh, was the um, Twilight Zone uh, TV series. And I would, you know, for me, the one that was the best at this was an episode called All the Time in the World. And in All the Time in the World, we meet this character here. Um, he's this kind of nebbish guy who works in a bank. No one likes him. He's not good at his job, doesn't have any friends, and all he really wants to do is read, and he keeps sneaking off to read. Um, and one day, yet again, he sneaks off to read. He goes down to the bank vault, and he's reading there alone. Nuclear Armageddon happens. And he comes out of the vault, goes upstairs, and the city is just destroyed. No one's there. Rubble is everywhere. And he's walking through, and he's sort of, you know, I'm the, I'm the last man standing. And he then passes a library, and there's pile upon pile of books there. And this, you know, last man in the middle of Armageddon gets a smile on his face because now. He has all the time in the world to do what he truly loves. And so he bends over to pick up the first book, and his glasses fall off. He searches for them. Crunch. He stepped on his glasses. He has all the time in the world, but he can't use it. I don't have all the time in the world, uh, so I have to end. Um, so with that, I'll leave you with this. Do not see story, do not see narrative as a replacement for the white paper, for the doctrine. I write those, I love them. But see it as another tool in your toolkit that can help you with the larger goal of critical thinking, which is how do I take that critical thinking and drive change with it? Thank you very much.
show of hands, how many fanboys and fangirls here for uh, Ghost Fleet? All right, if you haven't read it, boy, you gotta read it. Uh, so I look forward to the, your questions, and um, for those in the audience, please come down to the microphones, state your name, and then do ask a question, don't just ask a statement. And while I wait for folks to come to the audience, or to the uh, microphones, let me just ask a co couple questions that have come in uh, virtually. Uh, first one is, in projecting a ficient scenario for adver adversary consumption, and if the capability is not developed, is there a danger in creating a concept that the adversary might counter or replicate in actuality in advance of the tale? Got it. Um, so uh, that's the, the key here with, again, the purpose of um, not just dreaming things up, but uh, working the nonfiction is that in actual fiction, different from science fiction, different from techno thrillers, is that you've got the reference notes, you've done the research, and the reason why you have the research is um, the reasons of nonfiction. Um, one, uh, it gives credit to whoever else did that work, so that technology that was created, that report on it, um, it's, uh, it's basically you're avoiding plagiarism concerns, and there's a lot of concerns in that, and Nonfiction, and frankly, there's a lot of that stuff that goes on in fiction, people copycatting ideas and trying to make it their own. So one, you're giving credit where credit is due. Um, two, you are providing the um, reader the ability to go find more information about it. So as an example, um, with Ghostfleet, very kind of you, it had some issues related to supply chain security, microchip vulnerabilities, um, and uh, part of how Ghostfleet helped create change in the real world is, permit me a story, um, there was a meeting in the tank in the Pentagon, and um, uh, I was not there but was told this, um, one three-star sitting next to a three-star yawned. And they said, you know, well, up late last night, he said, yeah, I was reading this book, um, and it scared the blank out of me. Um, and then they got to talking about it, and they said, well, could it really happen? And so what did they do? They made their... Uh, staff officers go off and find out, could this actually happen? And well, there was footnotes to the DARPA report, this is real. Um, and so they came back and said, sir, yeah, it actually could happen. And then there was things created around it. The third reason why you have footnotes is um, CYA, uh, which is, is cover your butt um, in terms of uh, one, um, there are corporations and I've seen some of their names in the hallways, that got angry about certain things that were in the book and were like, that's not true. How dare you? And we had the footnote to the US government report. And we're like, it both validates that it's true. And if you want to do something about it, go talk to them, not us. But it also means that it's um, you're not providing information to any adversaries that's not already out there in the open. And as we well know, they are major consumers of everything. So. Um, it isn't that, uh, you know, that you know, like su supply chain security risks. We did not reveal that to the Chinese. It had been written about within um, US military institutions. It had also been written about in PLA documents. We, though, wrapped it within a narrative that helped senior leaders understand it in a way that led them to act when they weren't previously. Awesome. Our Marine here. Good afternoon, Mrs. Singer. Uh, my question is, in your time in the Obama administration or working for the Obama administration, what surprised you most about President Obama's, if you had the opportunity to interact with him, about his decision-making process? So uh, I am not going to uh, – I worked on the campaign. I was not in the administration. Um, so I can't speak to, like, you know, in the – um, uh, you know, being in the room where it happens uh, to reference a different narrative um, uh, on the major policy decisions that he made. Uh, I can reference my time during the campaign. Um, I, I, he was, what I found fascinating um, was that uh, there might be a group of, I was at one session where there was a group of um, campaign advisors and they'd reached out to a number of retired uh, flag officers from multiple services, and um, he had a very professorial take where he made sure, you know, I mean, y'all, flag officers are people with big personalities, 
And there was also a little bit of kind of competition in the room to catch his eye for maybe one day joining an administration. But he made sure to hear from everyone in the room. Um, and that, to me, there's, you know, it kind of reflected his background as not just, you know, senator, but someone who was a former professor and community organizer. Great. Uh, Captain Armstrong. Peter, good to see you again. Captain B.J. Armstrong, History Department here at the Naval Academy. Um, something we often do in our history classes when we're talking with our students, when they're writing papers for us, is we, we ask them to engage with a counter-argument. We ask them to engage with red teaming their own idea here. So I'm going to ask you to do that. What are the potential downsides, not as an author, I think you covered that pretty well with the, the footnote conversation and, and that kind of thing, but what are the potential downsides for a bureaucracy or an organization if FICIN is the entry point for all data? So I think um, there's a couple of uh, downsides. Um, one is the way that you ended it, if FICIN is the entry point for all data. It's probably, it would be the same, um, uh, issue that plays out in the the, the broader intelligence realm. Um, there are some people, unfortunately, who have the attitude of like, SIGINT is all that I need, or um, or go to a different agency building and no, HUMANT is all that I need. Um, uh, to now, uh, OSINT is enough. I don't need SIGINT or HUMANT. Um, and so if you had that, that same kind of attitude moved over to FICIN, I'm using scenario combined with analysis, you'd fall prey to the very same problem. Um, you need to pull in from multiple methodologies, multiple sources, uh, et cetera. That's one. Um, second is to, um, uh, to misunderstand um, the goals of that Project and, and it's been uh, one of the great things of, of a writer and the horrible things of a writer is to see people react to your work and utterly misinterpret it. Um, so uh, there was one writer who uh, did a nonfiction book that referenced Ghost Fleet and um, said, you know, this was the book that told everyone that high technology was the solution. And we're like, did you actually read the book? Like, it's literally not the point. Um, I, a different example for this audience um, is we were at a uh, event in Washington, D.C. about a year later, and an Army staff officer came up to us and said, you know, Ghost Fleet's awesome. It's had a lot of impact. Um, I, Army staff has been told to find out who paid for it. Why? Because it had a ship on the front and that somehow it's aided the Navy in its budget discussions. And so there was a belief that the Navy must have paid for Ghost Fleet. Our publisher um, laughed and was like, will they pay for it? Uh, <laughs> um, my, my boss just said, we're not that good. Yeah, so, um, uh, and, and similarly, um, uh, actually there was a PLA, um, I think it was PLA Weekly. One of their military journals did a book review on it and similarly thought that the US military had paid for it. Um, so there's misinterpretation of the goal. As I said before, sometimes the goal of the FICN is I'm just trying to explain. There's no action that I want from you. That example of the quantum briefing, it was solely for the senior leaders to, the next time they see something about quantum, they're able to go, okay, I know what a qubit is, or uh, oh, when people talk about quantum sensing, it's like in that story, when? Other times there's an ask that is, um, that example of the Air Force could look like this if it altered its um, talent management strategy. Okay, what are we gonna do now to make that come true? And the differences between them. Um, the third uh, challenge, and again, that falls, I think, in, in, in Ficken, and, and is um, there was a line from, uh, I'm trying to remember who, who said it, but uh, I'm, I wanna, I'm not gonna be able to credit them, but um, they basically said there's a name for someone who um, can't tell the difference between the views of a character and the views of an author. Idiot. Um, and uh, that's another where you're like, you know, someone would be like, well, the characters did this, and you're like, doesn't mean I actually believe that. Um, and so those are some of the challenges of it. I think the main one is the first, and I, that notice how I ended. Using story is not, does not mean utilizing your other tools. It's how do I carry it across? And, and I will add one last thing, because we're engaged on social media all the time. Um, history is, I think, a, back to your question about footnotes and, and referencing, history is a incredibly powerful source of narratives to deploy 
One, because um, it resonates. It's, it's that example of Britain, or we're doing a different one um, related to uh, where we're, you know, there's things that happened in World War II, and um, it's in the heritage of the group. It's more persuasive. Um, but there's a third reason is that it, when people say, well, that could never happen, you're like, actually, that did happen. That example of we, uh, the project that had a um, uh, surrender uh, of a U.S. unit, um, the original inspiration of it is from um, Major, Dever Major Devereaux, U.S. Marine Corps, 1942. Where was he? Wake Island. So it, and it's a story of what would happen to a U.S. unit if um, our logistics fell apart and the war didn't go the way that we had planned. And someone was stuck out on an atoll um, and didn't need more people, but needed more supplies. Someone had to make a horrible choice in 1942. Major Devereux had to make that kind of choice. So again, the, it could never happen. History can be an inspiration of narrative. All right, to our midshipman. Hello, sir. My name is Ella Niehoff, and I was wondering where we can look to find some more of the intelligence fiction like in terms of novels and resources, and then also as a midshipman, unlike younger generations, not misinterpreting the information in it? Yeah, great question. Um, so there's a couple of ways to, to find more of it. One is just uh, it's online, um, a tag for it all is hashtag thicket or, ha or useful fiction. The second is um, there are a variety of institutions that um, run uh, in, in journals that run series related to it. I'm, I'm looking to my side at uh, uh, Proceedings has run um, articles of Ficant. Um, the, uh, the there's Naval Futures ones that have run it. Um, notably, you didn't ask this, but they've run these as writing contests sometimes, where there is a um, reward, sometimes even a monetary reward, not just a publishing opportunity for people to um, write stories that help visualize the future through scenario. Um, so there's a variety of those. Uh, we've got a hub of them on our website that's useful dash fiction.com it's in the portfolio page so there's a lot a uh, lot of different places um, finally uh, there are certain in addition to proceedings there's uh, journals that have started to do um, more and more of it uh, as an example that that um, uh, I did sort of a you know 10 minute version of how to write a good narrative we did a larger project for your peers in the Air Force and um, actually as an output from it, two of them published their versions, they're on Defense One. Um, and so they're written by officers who uh, had never published anything and now they're published fiction writers. But again, it was fiction with a purpose. Um, one of them, for example, was to help explain the um, Air Forces uh, has a, in the Navy has a similar plan for um, collaborative combat aircraft, what it means for a pilot to be working alongside an AI, which sounds like sci-fi, but it is real. They told a story of this is what it would look like on a mission, um, as opposed to just saying we need combat collaborative aircraft. That was on Defense One. I think it's called like um, Flowers for Jacko or something like that. Um, so there's a variety of these that are out there and there's many more publishing opportunities for people that want to do it themselves. Great question, and uh, unfortunately we're out of time, but this was a, uh, a wonderful discussion. Nice to meet you in person. Yeah. Finally, as a, a, a person who's been a fan of your work and, and August Coles for a number of years, uh, we have a, and I, I'll, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that uh, Ficint also sort of started, no, I wouldn't say it started here, but a lot of this idea, you look at Hunt for Red October that the Naval Institute published, and you look at uh, Run Silent, Run Deep, uh, and some of the other things that we've published over the years, but uh, great to have you here in person, Dr. Singer, and we have a, a copy of War Transformed, which is not Ficant, but Mick Ryan does an amazing job with a number of narratives in this, which makes it such a great, uh, a great book. So thank you again for today, and please give him a round of, uh, of applause. Thank you.